The Batman is a movie that just came out and everyone loved it. Everyone loves Batman. Everyone knows Batman. It's an institution. Even those Japanese soldiers who hid in the jungle and still think World War II is going on would know Batman if you asked them. Batman has been an institution in pop culture for generations now. From the well old to boomers to millennials to Gen Zs like myself. And every handful of years they get a new unique Batman to reflect their era. And all of these Batman films have generally across the board been pretty good. As I said, everyone loves Batman. Because every Batman movie is sick. But what if I was to tell you that I'm lying and there's at least one that's, that's not good? How can this be? I hear you whimper. George Clooney! In 1997, George Clooney decided to take on the iconic role of Batman in, in Batman and Robin. Now, when I tell you this movie is bad, I don't just mean like Avengers Age of Ultron or Iron Man 2 bad. I mean more like Spider-Man Elsa pregnancy injection videos bad. Not necessarily boring, but confusing, isolating... And, and with a weird, uncomfortable sexual dynamic, which you aren't quite sure is appropriate given the target audience. Even though this is George Clooney's first and last outing as Batman, to be honest, I don't, I don't, know, I don't even know why he was cast as Batman. He, 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 does, he doesn't suit the role very well. This is also the final movie in an epic quadrilogy that began back in 1989 with Tim Burton's Batman. A pretty wacky Batman interpretation with Jack Nicholson as Joker and, and Michael Keaton as Batman. It's a pretty weird one with Batman committing mass murder fairly liberally and, and the establishment of no neck movement. Batman. A Batman movie staple that would stick around for a full 20 years right up until the dark night. I have no idea how they didn't manage to fix it till that late. Surely it's not that hard to make a flexible rubber mask. After the 1989 Batman, Tim Burton decided to double down on the feverish wackiness that is the foundation of this era of Batman. He got Danny DeVito to play Penguin, but unlike the very almost normal human gangster Penguin we all know now from the Batman, he was more a, a sewer goblin who ate raw fish and bit people's noses off. Somehow in the movie, Penguin managed just become mayor. Maybe he had really good policies, but I mean, he's, he's got three fingers. I, I I wouldn't vote for him. But after Batman Returns, Tim Burton dipped, Michael Keaton dipped, but the studio wanted to keep Batman breathing for, for that sweet moolah. So they recast pretty much all the roles and revamped, but it's, it's technically a sequel because Alfred is still played by the same actor, so, so that's how you know. Val Kilmer's Batman now and Jim Carrey is the Riddler. Also, Neon Mode is activated. Forget the gothic architecture, it's time to get to fabric. Batman Forever was pretty liked, but by most people. By today's standards, it's, it's, it's definitely not great. Robin, Riddler, and Two-Face are introduced. But at this point, it, it wouldn't matter what villain was actually being presented since everyone just seems to act like the Joker anyway. Everything is more over the top, bigger, and more colorful. And this is where we get we get, we get to Batman and Robin. Val Kilmer's pissed off, George Clooney is in. Is this truly the worst Batman movie? Is it as unwatchable as everyone has made out? Is it so bad that the director, Joel Schumacher, had to apologize for making it? We're gonna find out, that's why I made this video. The Batmobile comes up up into shot and we're given some of the worst opening dialogue I've ever heard in an actual movie. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. Huh? Anyway, they're fucking off out of the Batcave to confront a new villain on the scene, who a very uncharismatic Commissioner Gordon updates Batman about on FaceTime. Our new villain is none other than Mr. Freeze, performed by Californian Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. He also did some some other films, but they're, they're, they're not relevant in any way to this, to be honest, and, and they will not be a topic of discussion in this video. Anyway, Arnold is out here, and, he, and he's trying to steal a big, fat diamond. What happens in this scene is what I can only describe as an aggressive assault on the senses. <laughs> as Batman and Robin try and stop Arnold from grabbing his diamond. Mr. Freeze summons his goons who are all on ice skates because everything is covered in ice, obviously. Now, you may now be concerned for Batman and Robin's well-being as they have not they have not prepared for this situation. Who on earth would prepare for such icy conditions? Well, thankfully, both of their costumes are installed with retractable ice skates, just, just in the event of this very specific situation. This feature of the Batsuit brings with it many questions, as this is without a doubt the first time Batman and Robin have encountered Mr. Freeze. And so... Why, why do they have these installed? Why did Bruce Wayne see it fit to use resources as well as valuable tactical bat suit space to have <laughs> to have instant access to ice skates? But thinking like this goes against the spirit of what Batman and Robin is. It's supposed to be stupid. Well, this movie just reminds me of the live action Scooby-Doo movies from the early 2000s. They fuck about this museum playing ice hockey with a diamond smacking each other and doing backflips. Arnold keeps cracking ice puns because that is, that is basically his whole character. What killed the dinosaurs? Yes, hey. What the, the, 
and that's just not correct. For a second, it looks like Batman and Robin have saved the day and we, and we can be done with this movie within 10 minutes. But Agoon chucks the diamond to Mr. Freeze and he makes his getaway in a, in a, in a fucking rocket. A, a rocket. Batman grapples onto the rocket, but Mr. Freeze Ooh. freezes him. Just on his arms, though. And then it says the cold of space will kill him. And, and, he, and he gets by flying away with his retractable wings, which are seen for the first and last time. We, we never see those wings again. Thankfully, though, Robin Infinity Ward his way onto the spaceship and manages to save Batman from the clutches of death. Then they start um, air surfing on, on the doors in pursuit of Mr. Freeze and, and Robin says cowabunga. Cowabunga! As the rocket explodes behind them, I start to think about how Mr. Freeze had the resources to build a rocket of this size and where exactly its destination was. But where did he obtain the substantial amount of money to build the rocket? Was he aiming to land on the moon? These are not questions that Batman, who is supposed to be a detective, ever asks at any point. They chase Mr. Freeze through a dim corridor and as Robin goes to jump in, Mr. Freeze just blasts him with his huge ice cannon and takes back the diamonds. That man kind of just stands around awkwardly while Mr. Freeze doesn't shoot him and tells him that he can either save Robin or, or he can try and get the diamond back. What will you do? Chase the villain or save the boy? <laughs> so Batman saves Robin by putting him in a, in a pool of water and heating it up with a laser pen until it is red. I'm, I'm not sure that's how it works. I don't, I don't think water goes red when hot. To be honest, this opening sequence is about as good as it gets in terms of action. The choreography is decent. It has a great pace to it. Batman and Robin fail horribly and cause Gotham millions of dollars of damage, but you can't say this is boring. My main problem with it is that Robin didn't really do anything wrong to, to deserve this massive L he took. It's not like he gets too cocky or hot-headed and, and rushes in at the wrong moment. Moment. They were just like in the room together. Mr. Freeze could have killed them both in that moment if, if he felt like it, but he didn't because the movie has a two hour runtime. After this scene as a punishment for getting frozen, Batman makes Robin spend 10 hours playing League of Legends and that just, that just feels a little harsh. Right after you spend 10 hours playing League of Legends. 10 hours is a long time to spend disconnected from reality and that kind of thing can really mentally scar you. We're now introduced to the secondary villain, Poison Ivy, played by Kill Bill. She works in a building that is, is quite clearly evil just from the outside and somehow doesn't realise there's something dodgy going on inside. Her boss is an evil scientist and he decides to conduct an evil presentation in front of various dictators while she's just doing her shift in earshot. She watches the creation of Bane before being discovered by her boss and then gets murdered in, in probably the funniest way possible. Well, I can respect your opinion. Sadly, I'm not good at rejection. I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> she kind of falls into uh, into a load of mysterious chemicals, and when she emerges from it, she's, she's physically altered and completely insane. We're also shown Mr. Freeze's origin in the scene right after this, and it's, it's pretty similar. It's basically the same. He falls into a vat of mysterious chemicals and comes out physically altered and completely insane. This is just essentially the same origin as the Joker, and it's sort of just how the 90s Batman villains operate. Bane is a perfect example of how these movies just use iconic Batman villains and then just say fuck you to the fan base by having them act nothing like the characters they're supposed to be. Bane is supposed to be an intelligent mercenary that outsmarts Batman and nearly kills him. But in Batman and Robin, he's just like a roided up Lenny from Of Mice and Men. Does any of it matter though? Only if you're a fucking nerd. After this, a schoolgirl comes up to Wayne Manor and starts snooping around, sniffing around where she shouldn't. Before she can find out any epic Batman secrets though, Robin opens the door and, and, and starts perving on her legs. Robin, you're, you're like 30. Get those eyes of yours up right now. Turns out this is, this is Barbara Wilson, Alfred's niece. And they hold hands while walking around the garden, you know, as, as uncle and teenage niece normally do. From here we see Bruce Wayne as not Batman do something for the first time. He unveils a giant spy satellite that can survey the whole planet, but don't look inside his bedroom, he jokes. Just don't point it at my bedroom. Because if you do, you'll find the deed to George Clooney's actual satellite, which he does in fact own in real life. He uses it to keep an eye on, on Sudan to make sure there's no funny business going on over there. I'm not joking, he said he uses most of his uh, Nespresso money to fund this satellite. I guess this sort of highlights how George Clooney is essentially just playing himself both as Bruce Wayne and as Batman. Now correct me if I'm wrong but I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be a contrast between these two performances like between Batman and Bruce Wayne they're supposed to, they're supposed to be different aren't they? But even Clooney himself will admit that his performance was terrible and still to this day apparently if you go up and tell him you paid money to see this film he'll whip out his wallet and refund you. I've actually been doing this over the last few years putting on different disguises and affronting him and, and the sucker falls for it every time so far I've made $32. What oh, an idiot. Poison Ivy approaches is Wayne in the scene and tries to get him to save the planet. And this old woman who looks as though she owns an unhealthy amount of Dalmatians tells her that environmental concerns aren't really a problem because they have Batman and Robin to save them. In Gotham City, Batman and Robin protect us. It's not really relevant though, is it? Brucey pulls out a massive fancy invitation for his rainforest ball, which I guess he just 
he just had in his pocket. The invitation proudly shows that Batman and Robin will be there. And he tells her that they're going to be auctioning his family's diamonds to raise money for the city gardens. Now, who in this movie likes diamonds? And off screen does care about environmentalism. That's right, Mr. Freeze. Before we get into that, I just need to catch you up on a couple of story bits and also some cool facts that I thought were cool, so I'm going to tell you them. Number one, Mr. Freeze needs diamonds. If he doesn't have diamonds, then he will actually die. It's the way his suit functions and the way he himself built it to function. So he's only got himself to blame, really. Number two, his wife is frozen solid. She has something called McGregor's syndrome. If she gets unfrozen, Conor McGregor will beat her to death. I, I think that's how it works. They never actually explain what it does, so we can only assume. Number three, originally Patrick Stewart and Anthony Hopkins were in talks to play Mr. Freeze because in the animated series, he's just like a, like a sad nerd. But halfway through talks, the director, Joel Schumacher, realized that he wanted his Mr. Freeze to be, to be buff as fuck. To quote, big and strong like he was chiseled out of a glacier. If Arnold said no, the second choice would have been Sylvester Stallone. And if he said no, the third choice would have been Hulk Hogan. Number four, Arnold was paid $25 million to be in this film, which is one fifth of the entire budget and 25 times what George Clooney was paid. I, I don't think I've ever seen a worse use of budget. And number five, in 2008, Arnold Schwarzenegger signed SB375, the first law in the whole of America to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by controlling sprawl. So that was, that was good of him. So now we're all cleared up on that. It's pretty clear that Batman's plan is to give away these diamonds at a public event in order to bait Mr. Freeze to appear and try and steal them. Which means that all the people at the ball here are potentially collateral. It's a bit sus that Wayne invites a woman who's criticizing his business to an event he knows could result in her death. But little does he know, he's just doubled the threat on himself. We're now at the cool charity event and weird old men are bidding on women. And I did $30,000 for the lovely Magnolia! I don't know what for, but I guess it's just one of those activities weird old men with too much money get up to, like art collecting or, or gold. Poison Ivy is dressed as a gorilla for some reason. She takes the costume off him and blows dust that makes everyone fall in love with her. I, I have I have something a bit like that myself. It's, it's called my oozing charisma. She takes the necklace and, and the weird old men start bidding on her for some reason. I, get, I guess that's just what rich people do. They see something they want and just start shouting numbers. That man gets involved and pulls out his, his bad credit card in a, in a strange and confusing moment. But before she can even do anything, Mr. Freeze comes in and, and everyone has a bit of a fight. Ivy just gives Mr. Freeze the necklace that's on auction for some reason. And he nearly manages to make an escape in, in his cat in the hat looking ass car. But Batman manages to capture him without any of Robin's help since Batman decided to disengage Robin's bike as he didn't believe that Robin would be able to make that sick jump. And, and Robin is well annoyed and he goes, ah! Ah! <laughs> So now Mr. Freeze is in prison, everyone just decides to fuck about for a bit without doing anything of note. Barbara goes on a race, nearly dies, but Robin saves her. Bruce's girlfriend hassles him to marry her. Poison Ivy sets up her base with Bane. Cool. By now, any momentum the film has established is effectively gone. And also, by this point, which is over an hour in, you've become so desensitized by this whole thing that any entertainment value that could be pulled from how wacky it is, it's pretty much just giving me a headache now. Poison Ivy eventually comes and frees Mr. Freeze, seducing the guards with her seduction smoke. But Freeze is weak because the prison hasn't been able to provide him with diamonds. So they go on their merry way to get diamonds and get Freeze's wife. Ivy says she'll take on Batman and Robin who are in the room with Mrs. Freeze. Whilst Mr. Freeze fights the police for his diamonds, Bane pretty much whacks both Batman and Robin. Ivy manages to get Robin to nearly kiss her before Batman cock blocks him telling him, oh her, her lips are poisoned, y you'll die. Cringe. They have a scrap and Robin gets thrown into some ice cream or something allowing Ivy to get away to Mrs. Freeze. But instead of saving her, Ivy decides to pull the plug so she can have Mr. Freeze all to herself. When she meets Freeze, she tells him a big fib and, and says it was actually Batman who decided to pull the plug. And his most logical response to this is to destroy all of Gotham with, with his ice. So they can repopulate the earth with her, her plant creatures. And Mr. Freeze, whose only motivation up until this point has been to save his wife, thinks that's a swell idea and agrees. He doesn't even seem that upset about his wife, he just seems genuinely excited to have an excuse to commit a load of destruction. Meanwhile, at the Batcave, Robin is not happy. He's more upset than Mr. Freeze was, and all because Batman wouldn't let him get put in a spliff by Poison Ivy. Batman patiently explains that Poison Ivy is actually the villain of the movie, but Robin's not having any of it and, and walks out on him. And to make matters worse, Alfred's not feeling well. A doctor comes and gives the, the grave news. Alfred has McGregor Syndrome Stage 1, which I think means Conor McGregor is just coming over and giving him concussions, but they never actually show this, so I, I can't be 100% sure. We learned earlier on that Barbara's main goal in this film is to free Alfred from slavery. Alfred has supported me my whole life and I'm gonna pay him back. 
I'm going to take him away from this dismal life of servitude. But this is all cleared up when Alfred tells her that he is a paid butler and actually wants to be there. It's, it's, it's like his only thing. He gives her a secret encrypted hard drive, which I imagine has all his nudes stored on it. Barbara finds out the Wayne's secret and CGI Alfred tells her that he's made her a Batgirl outfit for her. I guess just, just in the event that she, she wanted to be Batgirl. So we get ready for the final boss fight with Poison Ivy. She's one of the final bosses that is standing between the Bat family and Mr. Freeze. And we finally have the conclusion to the two hour long arc in this film for Ivy. Will she kiss Robin? And yes, she will. But Robin employs the, the super clever gadget of rubber lips. So she, she, she can't kill him, but he still gets a kiss. So that's epic. And then proceeds with the help of Batgirl, who I, who I guess is just there now. I don't know how she knew where to go. To chuck Poison Ivy into her, her giant piranha plant. Mr. Freeze freezes some of Gotham with a, with a big ice gun. So it's the perfect opportunity for the film to showcase its Toys R Us exclusive snowmobile modified bat vehicles. And make sure you also pick up the rare alternate ice defense costume action figures. This isn't a paid sponsorship, but I know Toys R Us are having a tough time right now, so I figured I, I, I just chuck them a bone. You're welcome, Dave Brandon, CEO of Toys R Us. You're welcome for that bone, mate. They make it to the tower where Mr. Freeze has set up his ice laser, and their plan is simple. To use the previously mentioned satellite, do you remember that one? The, the one from like the uh, near the beginning of the film? To redirect the sun and unfreeze Gotham. It's, it's a great plan, but Mr. Freeze wants to stop them from doing that, as you can imagine. And a, a totally unhinged and sickening action sequence in shoes. Until finally Mr. Freeze falls to the ground like an upturned turtle, seemingly ready to give up. That man gives the final blow, but it's not a punch or, or a kick. It's a little screen that plays footage of the movie from like 15 minutes ago, where he covertly films Poison Ivy admitting that she killed Mrs. Freeze. Batman talks to him, you know, mano a mano. Real talk. He tells him that Mrs. Freeze is still alive, which which we never see, so, so he, he could just be lying, and encourages him to give up the cure for McGregor syndrome so he can get Alfred back to work. As a thank you for this, Batman makes sure Mr. Freeze ends up sharing the same cell with Poison Ivy, where he says he's going to make her life a living hell. So at the very least, the implication is that he's going to physically and emotionally torture her. So I, I, I guess Mr. Freeze didn't really learn any kind of lesson here, and the cycle of cruelty is just allowed to continue. The movie is at an end, and they all run towards the camera together. We get credits, and I'm finally free. Now, this is definitely the worst Batman movie out there. Watching this film is like having to babysit a three-year-old only child. At first, they may come off pretty sweet. You know, you're chilling with them. You're kind of having a good time. But at some point, halfway through the second bag of Haribos, something changes. And as you're getting more in the mood to just put on the TV and scroll through the messages you and your ex have, this little shit's just getting started. What ensues is you having to spend the rest of your babysitting time watching this kid smear crayons on the wall, stuff his face with Pepsi and pizza rolls and violently try and wrestle you. There's a lot of spirit there, a lot of heart. And in some ways, you can almost admire this little twat that smells a piss. But at some point, all you want it to do is shut the fuck up and act like a normal human being for a minute. Ultimately, Batman and Robin is not an experience you're likely to forget, but it's also not one you'll want to repeat. But I think there's credit to be given to a film that's laying the base of exactly what people don't want. Without that influence, we may not have the compass to go in the other direction for more accurate and darker superhero films, and that's not just my opinion. Kevin Feige, president of Marvel, said, Batman and Robin is the most important comic book movie ever made. It was so bad that it demanded a new way of doing things. It created the opportunity to do X-Men and Spider-Man adaptations that respected the source materials and adaptations that were not campy. So even if you don't like Batman and Robin because you hate the way they represented Batman, you got Batman and Robin to thank for changing that. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you're new and I'll see you in a bit. Bye bye.